And when I was asked, I, I told the president, I don't have anything on the docket, but just so you know, if Capital Group ever calls with a portfolio manager job, I leave that day. I knew the funds before I started investing in them. I knew how people used them. I knew how they thought about in putting them in portfolios. The mortgages are up near 7% now, but where do rates settle? I mean, it's really the multi-trillion dollar question. And you're gonna answer it for everyone <laughs> yeah, who's listening and watching. Exactly I love answer. that. I'm Mike Gitlin. Welcome to another episode of the Capital Ideas Podcast, where we get to meet the people behind the portfolios. We get to hear their investment edge, some of the lessons they've learned during their career, how they came to Capital Group, and we have some fun along the way. Today, we have John Queen with us, a fixed income portfolio manager. John's been at Capital Group for more than 20 years. He's based in West LA. And John, welcome. Thanks, Mike. Good to be here. So John, you started as a dealer service rep, a DSR. We use acronyms for everything. Mm -hmm. And so you were a dealer service rep in Brea. Tell us a little bit about joining in that capacity and then how that informed a little bit of how you manage money today. Sure. Uh, it was a, a really interesting start uh, to my career. My dad had worked at Merrill, told me about American Funds, Capital Group, the name wasn't really known at the time. This was 1989. Uh, so I interviewed. Uh, got the job out in Brea, and it was a fantastic introduction to all things American funds. Uh, I got to really talk to the dealers who sold our funds on a daily basis, what their concerns were, what their clients' concerns were, where the different portfolios fit, uh, where the different funds fit into the portfolios, and what they were really looking for from the different uh, components. And so that's what we did most of the day was just talking to advisors and clients, ultimate shareholders. Um, and it's a it's a great and I think differentiating understanding of what it is we do managing money for our shareholders. Um, so you were a guide to them. You, you sort of give give them the insights into some of our different strategies and the risk and those kinds of things. That's right. It could be as simple as sending back out literature or quoting yields, or it could be how might this portfolio fit in, this fund fit in the portfolio? I need something in international. Okay. I think as an investor, uh, now it, it really gives me a unique perspective uh, versus m the way most investors come in to the capital group because I knew the funds before I started investing in them. I knew how people use them. Um, I knew what people really wanted from them rather than sort of what a marketing uh, brochure might say. I knew how they thought about in putting them in portfolios. Um, so I think about that a lot as I manage portfolios today. What those clients, what those shareholders, what those advisors might have thought about this fund and how it might fit in their portfolio day. So you started closest to the client effectively. So that that's a great way to start. It's pretty unique at Capital Group. In Brea, you also were trained by a brilliant individual. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, uh, and it's true. It certainly has had a big impact on my life, uh, the training uh, as well as beyond. Uh, so, uh, one of my first training moments was they have you double team, listen in on phone calls with an experienced dealer service representative. <clears throat> in this case, uh, the woman was Marie Femino, uh, was outstanding. She was only six weeks in, but considered good enough and a veteran enough to be training new people already. What year was this? This was uh, November of 1989. Okay. Um, and so had a big impact on me personally uh, because in 1995, of course, we were married and she is now Marie <laughs> Queen. So uh, uh, always, always good to be trained by your better half and lots of things. Training still goes on. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, all right. So it's very rare to leave Capital Group. People stay for a really long time. And it's even more unique to leave and then come back. But you boomeranged. You left for about a dozen years and you came back. Share that experience. Why, why'd you leave and why'd you return? Yeah, it was interesting. And I certainly, in many ways, didn't want to leave initially. Uh, I was had moved from being a dealer service rep to a trader. Um, and I've got to say that on a day-to-day -day basis, being a trader is a blast. It was one of the most fun jobs I've had day-to-day. -day. But I recognized 
within a few years that what I really enjoyed about the markets and capital and the job was thinking about big picture components to it, not the in, not the moment to moment day to day of of trading bonds. And I was looking to to push that direction by becoming a portfolio manager. Um, the way we were structured at the time, uh, it wasn't likely to happen within capital. And so I had to make the decision, do I leave what I think is the best firm that I know of, the people I've grown up with now in the business, uh, and pursue this job, or do I stay comfortable? And I decided to, to leave. I went to another company um, to manage portfolios. It was an institutional uh, mutual fund portfolio manager in bonds. It began to give me the breadth of understanding of markets, um, what it takes to be a portfolio manager. I continued to do that for a number of years. Ended up leaving there and started another fixed income business at a, a company, Roxbury Capital, out in Santa Monica. Uh, did that for a number of years. Some things happened in the company where we were going to need to shut that down, and I was asked to stay on uh, as chief operating and chief compliance officer for a year or so. Um, and when I was asked, I, I told the president, um, I like what we're doing here. I think we can grow something. I'll stay. Just so you know, I don't have anything on the docket, but just so you know, if Capital Group ever calls with a portfolio manager job, I leave that day. And the reason was, I believe Capital Group is the best place to work in this business, not just because it's a great company. The people you work with are amazing and continued to be my best friends in the world from my time that had been there, even though it was 12 years earlier. Um, but also because I believe that more than any other company I've ever been a part of, uh, focusing on doing right by the shareholder is really ingrained in everyone here in a, in a way that's very different. And so the combination of things I did as a trader, uh, managing institutional mutual funds at, at, at Hotchkiss and Wiley, managing municipal bond portfolios at Roxbury, all came together to when Capital was hiring to find a new por uh, private client services portfolio manager who could do all of those things. I had both the history and hadn't burned too many bridges, uh, as well as the experience in a wide variety of areas that fit the role and, and we was got able you to come back. back. Yeah, we got your back. So you're managing fixed income portfolios. We talk about four roles of fixed income in a balanced portfolio. We talk about diversification, inflation protection, income, capital preservation. But for, for the group who's listening and watching, why should they own bonds? Just basic, basic fixed income. Why would someone own bonds in a portfolio? I think when you think about core bonds, uh, the goal is to create um, a portion of the portfolio that's predictable. Uh, that dampens the volatility overall. The portfolio provides some of that income that helps dampen that volatility and, and gives a more consistent return over time. Um, also, when things tend to go really poorly, a recession, think back to 2008, uh, bonds tend to do well when riskier assets like stocks tend to do poorly. And so thinking about the pattern of returns you're looking for from uh, your bonds and where those fit into that broader portfolio is really important. And so going back to my time as a dealer service representative and knowing how people think about that puzzle piece fitting into their portfolio is something I think about a lot. Um, so it's going to be different for different bond funds. You know, we've got we've got ones that are bond accounts. They fit different sleeves, if you will. Some are a bit of income, not moving around a lot. Some move around a little bit more, give more income, can provide a little bit better movement opposite that of equities when things really uh, go off the rails. But where those fit is each very different um, on each person's portfolio. And so, you know, where do they fit? They fit that side that that makes the ride a little bit smoother as they try to get to their ultimate destination. The destination tends to include growth from equities, but you want the ride to be smooth enough that you feel comfortable along the way. So let, let's take that to portfolio solutions. You're on our solutions team as well. So you help put bonds into more balanced solutions and portfolios. How does that group, how does that group construct portfolio series, different solutions? How do you think of that? What's your role and how do you think of it? Well, first, my role is as uh, a, an experienced investor helping give 
the insight of somebody who actually manages portfolios back into the group that does the quantitative work to see where the pieces fit together. Mm -hmm. uh, and they do an unbelievable amount of interesting modeling and things of long-term expectations, how portfolios might behave, how you might structure something. But then it's really important to have the practical side come back in and look at that and say, yeah, I love what you've done here. This makes a lot of sense. You know what? This one might not behave the way you think it might under certain circumstances. Let's talk about that and go back and figure out alternative options. And then the 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 quantitative group will go back and do the, the work again on that. So that's my role as sort of this part of this advisory group that helps with that. We think a lot about exactly what I'm saying for an individual investor, how it might fit in these broader portfolios. That's what Solutions does, is create broad portfolios that fit particular needs. Uh, retirement a long time out, college in a few years. There's a lot of different uses for different portfolios. And so the Solutions Group is really looking at building portfolios that fit each of those needs and fixed income what what role it plays will be quite different, again, depending on what your time horizon is, what that goal is. But conceptually, it's very similar. Is it somebody who's going to need this money soon? So it's mostly about preservation, and we're going to think about a specific set of fixed income that will fit that. Or is it 40 years out till retirement? It's mostly equities and growthy and exciting, but a little more volatile. And so what part of fixed income might play a role there? So you're putting pieces of the puzzle together. Exactly. That's that's good. If you if you look at the market today, <clears throat> rates went up a lot. Rates went up 500 basis points. And everyone is waiting for the first cut. And then you worry about, okay, so we'll we'll get the first cut at some point in the not so distant future in all likelihood. But where do rates settle? So mortgages are up near 7% now. That's very high relative to the most recent 20-year period. But where do rates settle? Is it 5%, 4%, 3%? Because the likelihood of going back to zero interest rate policy, which we had after the financial crisis for a long time, is probably low. What's your perspective? It's, I mean, it's really the ulti the, the multi-trillion dollar question. And you're course. gonna answer it for everyone <laughs> yeah, who's listening and watching. I answer. love that, go for it. Um, I think one of the interesting things is that, and again, my experience and my time horizon, having been in the markets for a long time, gives me a little bit of a different perspective. I think most people are looking at, as you say, rates have gone up a lot. We're used to 0% or near 0% interest rates. Um, and so we assume we'll go back toward that. Most of my career interest rates were much higher than that, and the economy uh, operated quite well. I think that can continue to be the case. And I think it will settle, rates will settle lower than they are now. I think they are somewhat restrictive on economic activity uh, out there. But they're not, if you watch the economy right now, it's going along pretty nicely given how high interest rates are. Um, so I don't think it's quite as hurtful to the economy as as most people thought it would be. So where will we settle if, if say, 10-year treasuries to use a, a benchmark are four and a half-ish right now, um, I think they could settle to a range of three and a half to four and a half, uh, depending on what's going on in the markets. I think the Fed, who's kind of the, the bellwether that people look at with the rate cuts, um, I think they'll come back down. But if inflation is too ish and that's kind of what they're planning on short-term interest rates could easily be three three and a half if economic growth is quite good and and it certainly seems to be right now so my best guess is three three and a half on the very short end with fed funds and money markets and four four and a half on tenures i saw a stat the other day on the 10-year u.s treasury yield something to the effect that pre-financial crisis, pre-2008, for 50 years when inflation was around 2%, the 10-year was about 4.5% where it is today. So the concept of it going back towards zero should be out of people's minds. I think that's exactly right. We, we call that difference between the treasury rate and inflation the real rate. And that gap is kind of what you would expect between a four and a half in, a half, four and a half ten year treasury and a two percent inflation rate so if i don't own core bonds today and i added them to the portfolio 
And there's lots of different flavors of bonds you could add to the portfolio. We recently had Kirsty Spence on. She talked about emerging market debt. But what should my five or 10 year total return expectations be for bonds at the core of the portfolio? I think ultimately what you should anticipate in bonds is getting what you're yielding currently as a, as a return expectation. Now, if so we, the income equals the return effectively. Exactly. Now, if you, if you assume, as we've just stated, that yields might on parts of the portfolio come down a little bit over that time, you'll get some capital appreciation. So it might be a touch better than that, depending on your time frame. But I'd go in and say core bonds, five to six percent, probably closer to six, given extra things you can do beyond treasuries, um, is a pretty reasonable expectation for going forward. Yeah, you talked about risk and diversification. If you think about that, five to six percent in core bonds, our long term capital market assumptions for equities over the next 20 years is about 7%. So you're you're getting 85% the way there through bonds uh, with a little less risk. That's exactly right. Uh, there certainly tends to be less volatility on the bond side. You've got higher income again now on the bond side after 15 years of not having higher incomes there. Um, and as you say, the return expectations are quite attractive uh, with lower volatility and, and lower risk. And again, combined with other parts of the portfolio, things that might do well when other parts of the portfolio like your stocks might, might be doing less well. Great. I'm going to shift a bit to your style as a portfolio manager. And this is the humbling part of the conversation where you tell us when you're not right, why aren't you right? What, what typically is it that makes you lag the benchmark, lag competitors? Because you do well over the long term, but they're episodically, you may have some challenges with results. What causes that? I think ultimately what causes it for me is probably the same thing that causes it for most investors. And it's sort of general behavioral science or, or uh, where, you know, I, I tend to get used to doing things a certain way, using certain rules of thumb, certain assumptions that parts of the market are going to behave a certain way. Yeah, and it's very easy to forget to step back and say, OK, this is happening right now. What's going to change it? And what will that look like? Um, I've heard you. I've heard you refer to that as intellectual laziness. I heard you. Constructive say, laziness. Is constructive laziness? Okay. <laughs> e either way, lazy is somewhere in the word. Well, well, and and inevitably, if I do it right, yes, and I structure the portfolio well, I have to do less on a day to day basis to try to adapt it to the market. I think what tends to happen when things are not haven't gone as well, it's because. I'm watching things happen and I'm trying to adjust into a moving market rather than using that constructive laziness, stepping back a little bit, trying to figure out what's my longer term view, which is what I think I have a better sense of than day to day, what's going to change tomorrow? Um, and how will this portfolio behave on that longer term view rather than letting, letting the emotional side that everybody has watch the market and, right. and adjust it a little bit? So what's your investment edge? You know, it's a good question. And it's something I've thought a lot about since coming back to capital. Um, and I think ultimately it's that I'm a true generalist. Um, I, I, I like, as I said, the reason I left was I loved the putting the puzzle pieces together, thinking about the big picture. And I think if you, the history of my education and career um, covers a lot of different areas. Um, I, I was an engineering major, so I understand the quantitative side of things, but I'm not a quant. Um, I've done some analysis, but I'm not a great deep analyst. Um, I've seen different markets over a long period of time. Uh, I often joke that I've, I've lived now through 11 or 12 once in a lifetime markets. <laughs> um, and so I think the breadth of experience um, gives me perspective on how different puzzle pieces might fit together. And when I came back to capital, you really had to dig in deep and say, OK, I've got unbelievable analysts. The quality of the people we have is astounding, uh, from traders to analysts in different parts of the fixed income market to our equity colleagues, our economics colleagues. Um, so wh what do I add? What, what, am I, what am I doing in the middle of all that? Uh, and I think the 
you used the captain's chair analogy when we were talking earlier, and I think that's exactly right. Thinking about the broad swath of what's going on, what's all the good information out there, seeing this piece and this piece and how they might come together to synthesize some distinct piece of new information and how that might impact the portfolio. And I think that that generalist piece means I, I can let the analysts be the experts on the deep analysis, on the fundamentals of companies or security types or the economy. And my job is to put all those pieces together and find how that puzzle forms a new picture. And I think that's that's what I do well. We have these resources at Capital Group that are truly differentiated. So you just take the pieces of the puzzle and put them together. And I think that's I think that's a good lesson for a lot of portfolio managers and investors is be a listener, be a learner, because you're taking those insights and using them in the portfolio the way you see fit. And, and I think that's a differentiator for you. Um, I do want to get to our office treasure hunt. And I went into your office and I found something that most people would find relatively disturbing, especially me. So what I found, John, was this bobblehead, mm -hmm. and we have listeners and we have viewers. Can you describe to our listeners what this handsome, bald individual, who this is in your mind? Well, I know that the viewers might think, oh, it's Lex Luthor, but no, no, it's not. <laughs> It is, in fact, my, my Gitlin in a blue suit with a blue tie and a red cape, a little logo at the bottom saying the head in charge. Uh, and, of course, on the bobblehead, the head is a little exaggerated, just a, just a shade. Um, so tell us, like, how, how did this come about? Uh, because for me, it was certainly a surprise. I, I mean, I'd like to say I can neither confirm nor deny any involvement in it, uh, but there was a small number of people who suggested that it might be as you were rising to be CEO of the firm, and congratulations. Thank you. Um, that it might be fun to have something to commemorate it. You've got a good sense of humor and it can be self-deprecating, so playing off that a little bit might be good. Um, and so they thought of the bobblehead. However, they ran into a, a, a couple of bottlenecks. One is concern that there might be a negative reaction. Yeah. And two, finding the photos needed for the head in particular. How'd you solve, the first one, I do have a good sense of humor and I think it's reasonably funny and somewhat handsome, but how'd you get the picture? Fortunately, I, uh, my wife, who uh, in her training has also let me know that she can take care of things uh, that I can't, uh, is quite good friends with your lovely wife mm. uh, and was able to reach Used out. Used to be. <laughs> you reach out and get some photos that we're, right. we're able to create the bobbleheads. Well, I appreciate it. There's a couple hundred of these making their way through the hallways globally at Capital Group. Uh, and I think you could probably find one on eBay for like 25 cents. Um, I do have a, a special surprise for mm. you. And for anyone who's wondering, for, if we if John knows this is playing, the answer is obviously no. <laughs> so I'd love to return the favor for our listeners. What we have on the screen behind me is a bobblehead of John. And it is being made. <laughs> Couldn't have an opportunity to make it, but it is being made. And, and I hope that I can distribute it as broadly as you distributed mine, J just to return the favor. Thank you. I appreciate that it appears to have more hair than I actually do. So that's a handsome John Queen in the bobblehead, and we'll share it around fixed income and elsewhere. On a personal level, cars are in your blood. Your grandfather, he used to build and race cars. I think your father was one of the founders of the Long Beach Grand Prix, and you and your father raced in, a, I think, a thousand mile race. Tell us about cars and how they're so important to you. Sure. As you say, my, my blood has cars in it. Throughout growing up, uh, I remember uh, my dad would always be mad that I'd read the road and track before he had a chance to every month when it would come. Um, you know, we... Uh, would do car things on the weekends. Uh, and from the time I was fairly young, um, my dad became involved in starting the Long Beach Grand Prix. So a guy named Chris Pook uh, was a travel agent in Long Beach, decided, well, Long Beach can be like Monaco. Let's put a race together here. And at the time, Long Beach was not a lot like Monaco other than being on the water. It was a Navy town. Um, and had this, this vision and got Dan Gurney, uh, one of the great American race drivers and car builders at the time, uh, and 
then three local guys, including my dad, who were was assistant manager of the Merrill Lynch office at, uh, as the finance guy to help put this thing together. Um, and so, so what great, year was that uh, approximately? Starting about probably 73 and four uh, was when they started the work. The first race was 75. Um, and it's a great story. My, uh, we stayed at the, the Queen Mary, the hotel as little kids. I was 11 at the time. We'd come in every day to, to watch the stuff that was going on. My dad would be there because it was a shoestring operation initially. And so despite being the finance guy, they're putting up banners and helping push in place barricades and things. Um, so the race was a Formula 5000 race, which was a short-lived series to test the track and make sure it was okay for Formula One. Um, and as it's nearing the end, I didn't know any of this. I was watching. Uh, apparently, they couldn't find the queen to award the trophy to Brian Redman, who ended up winning, South African driver. Um, and so I got to the victory stand to watch it. And there's my mom up there with Brian Redman getting champagne all over her suit, handing the trophy to him. Uh, and it was so a great experience. Truly always been in our blood right from the beginning. And quickly on the thousand mile race, what is it? What? Why would you race a thousand miles in a vintage car? What? What is it? So originally there was a real race, flat out, fast as you could go, from 1927 to 1957 in Italy, thousand miles on the country roads of Italy. Um, and it ended in 1957 after a crash where tragically a lot of people were killed. The record was set in 19, uh, 1955, was over 100 miles an hour. To on, a, on average. On average, 1,000 miles, averaging 100 miles an hour on country roads of Italy. I mean, just an astounding feat. So they stopped the race. In the late 70s, they started it back up as a rally. So now it's three days. You have to have a car that could have or did race in it back originally when it was a race. Um, and so I got to be the navigator with my dad. He had a 1952 Ferrari uh, 212 Europa. Um, and uh, it was an astounding experience, both driving through the, the countryside of Italy, crowds in every uh, city welcoming you in. You know, they love their cars, and so they can point to cars, the average person knowing, oh, that's Vignale body or whatever. And then it was also three days with my dad uh, driving through Italy and, and just experiencing it. So it, pretty much one of the real highlights. Any of the three kids into cars now? All of them to some degree. My daughter, interestingly, is probably the one who's most into racing and watches Formula One with me. Uh, both my sons like cars, but more of the kind of off-road Jeep kind of thing. Okay, and can we do anything with fast cars and long-term investing? Can we put them together in any takeaway? You know, I, I think there are some parallels. Um, less less so for my, at my level of capability on cars, but uh, I was watching Monaco and the level of focus it takes to do well at racing. Obviously, there's skill, there's talent, there's all kinds of aspects that are specific to racing. But to be good at it, you've got to be able to go multiple laps at very high pressure, reacting to things as they change, and yet maintain focus over an hour or two hours or three hours to hit the exact same spot over and over again. Not get distracted by the emotional side of fear going into a corner too fast or somebody cutting you off. And I think that that focus and that discipline actually is a real parallel to what we do investing portfolios. So we're gonna end up today, and we do this in every one of our episodes where we talk about what we're grateful for. It's, it's a nice way to end, and it's a reminder of gratitude being super important in our lives. As I get out your fancy mug, I'll give you a moment to think about it. I will share one of mine. And what I am grateful for is at Capital Group, we recently rolled out the long-term strategic plan to our 9,000 associates. And in, in that long-term strategic plan, we talk about why we're evolving for our clients and why the industry is evolving and how it's evolving. We talk about what we'll look like at Capital Group in 2031, which is our centennial. But the how in all of it are the 9,000 associates that drive that plan and execute the plan. So I am grateful for the 9,000 associates who are gonna drive our long-term strategic plan. John, what are you grateful for? I, I feel like I've been incredibly fortunate throughout my life and career, so there's a lot to be grateful for. But as I think about it now, you talked about being trained by a brilliant woman. Um, 
I talked about earlier the people I got to know on the trading desk and who became my best friends in the world. Uh, I got to know John Lovelace a little bit while I was a trader, um, which was an amazing experience. Um, I feel like capital really has been at the core of everything that now is my life um, and what capital has given me. And it sounds maybe a little cliche to, to be, you know, sit here and be grateful for the company, but really it has given me everything um, that, that, I, that I feel like I currently have in, a, in large parts of my life. And so I'm truly grateful for Capital Group, the associates you're talking about, for John Lovelace for having put the structure together to make it the place it is and the culture it has. Um, I just couldn't be, I couldn't feel better about being somewhere in my life than here. That's a great way to end it. We'll close it there. And I, I will give you your mug. You can take this away. Thank you for joining the podcast. Please subscribe to Capital Group on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And join us again next time. Have a great day.